it going? Welcome to Screen Speak, the podcast that is all about movies, life, and so much more. I'm Jordan Anderson, this is my podcast, and I do sincerely appreciate each and every one of you for coming by and giving it a listen. Uh, If you haven't done so already, you know I gotta do it, it's the plugs. Go ahead, follow, download episodes of Screen Speak on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, wherever you get your podcasts at, go ahead and do uh, the follow. Specifically the follow. The follow would actually be good, um, though I think the, down- the the downloads actually help as well, but uh, follow follow would be preferable. Uh, then you can also go ahead and check out the Instagram for the podcast, just simply titled at ScreenSpeak Podcast. Uh, I definitely post on there from time to time when I can, and it has some, some interesting uh, little insights and sneak peeks on episodes and upcoming things and, and that sort of thing, and you know, I just post about movies and whatnot on there too, so go ahead and take a look at that. Uh, and then lastly, you can also take a look at the YouTube page for Screen Speak, just simply titled Screen Speak. So there's the plugs, they're done, let's keep going. Um, how is everybody doing out there today? Are you doing well? Did you make it through the week? Um, is your week over yet even? I mean, does it presumably end on Friday? I'm not, I'm not really sure, but if it is, you know, if it has ended for you, then congratulations. I'm, I'm glad that you made it. Does it, do you need a congratulations for just existing and making it through your week? I don't know, but I'm going to give you a congratulations because you know what? We could all use a little bit more positivity in our lives, folks. You know it's true, so I'm going to try to to do that, um, I don't know, more often on, on this episode and life, whatever. It's, it's it's very easy these days to be a pessimist now, isn't it? Um, anyway, where am I where am I going with that? I, I don't know. This, this this happens sometimes on this show. It just, it's just, uh, it's part of the podcasting medium. You can go off into a lot of different territories without even realizing you're doing it, except when you talk about doing it, as you realize you're doing it. And you just keep making it worse by continuing to talk about uh, to talk about that. So let's uh, move on. Um, <laughs> okay. So I I'm actually really I'm really actually excited to talk about the the movie that I'm going to be uh, covering on today's episode, Signs. Uh, Signs with Mel Gibson and Joaquin Phoenix, directed by M Night Shyamalan and also written by him. And I'm actually, I, I normally have this information actually in front of me before I hit record on this, but I'm trying to, trying to say, when did this come out? Holy cow, this came out in 2002? Damn, this came out in 2002, unbelievable. Wow, okay, I mean, uh, I guess it was released on July 29th, if you want to know the truth, in 2002, Signs was, but anywho, before I get into that, I just want to say how excited I am to talk about it, because Signs is... Signs is one of those movies that I I think it's it's very how do I want to how do I want to put this it's ripe for the picking that maybe maybe that doesn't make sense but there's a lot that I think you can actually unpack when you really actually dig into a movie like this there's a lot beneath the surface there's a lot uh, between the scenes you know between the lines of dialogue there's a lot of things that are said that aren't said. Um, there's, there's actually a lot going on with this movie, both from a a writing standpoint. Um, but then I would also just say from like the way it's shot, the, the, the choices, creative choices that are made on this movie. Um, there's some really interesting things that I, I think that you're going to find in this, this episode that are worth, uh, I don't know, picking your brain over or, or, or hopefully talking about with somebody else. So I don't know if you, if you like some of the stuff I have to say on this, then, you know, I, I guess I'm throwing in another plug. Share it with your friends. Share the podcast with your friends. You, you know, who knows? They they might end up liking. <laughs> they might end up liking this. Uh, okay, let me talk a bit about the synopsis. What this movie's actually about. So, here's the synopsis. Everything that farmer Graham Hess, uh, played by Mel Gibson assumed about the world is changed when he discovers a message an intricate pattern of circles and lines carved into his crops as he investigates the unfolding mystery he finds uh sorry what he finds will forever uh alter the lives of his brother joaquin phoenix and 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 his children uh played by rory culkin and abigail breslin a unique story it's a unique story that explores the mysterious real life phenomena 
uh, of crop signs or crop circles and the effects that they can have on one man and his family. That is actually, you know, I've commented about this on, on the podcast before when I read some of these official synopsises for the, the movies, but that's a good one. That's a good one because it it talks a bit about sort of what the story is exploring, but it really doesn't give a lot away. And that's interesting because sometimes these sometimes these synopsises for movies that I read, I I look at them and I'm just like, why are you you're, you're giving away like the entire story? I might as well just read this paragraph and not even watch the movie. I, I don't know. So that's I'm this first time I'm reading this uh, on here, so it's it's refreshing to see that to say the least. So that's the synopsis of the movie, and like I said, uh, it stars Mel Gibson, Joaquin Phoenix, Ror- uh, is it Rory Culkin? Yeah. Yeah, Rory Culkin and Abigail Breslin, which I'll get into them in a little bit. But I want to talk about some of the <clears throat> some of the just my personal uh, background with the movie, experience with the movie, uh, what, it, what what it was like when I first saw it in two thousand two. Which this this is another sign, people. Uh, <laughs> sign pun, pun intended, I guess. So I'm literally <laughs> I'm literally doing some math here because I can't figure out. I'm like, how the hell old was I? Okay, yeah, I was 11 years old when I saw this movie, because I did see it when it came out. I can actually thank my dad for that. He, uh, which I guess I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll give my dad a quick plug here. Um, <clears throat> I definitely think I can thank my dad when it comes to horror movies, because I don't really, I don't really like a lot of them necessarily. I mean, I, I like this one a lot, um, but. I don't know. My my dad was always good about letting me from a younger age watch things that some parents maybe wouldn't let their kids watch. And I'm not saying the signs is necessarily like the worst movie for a kid to watch, but it's it's very suspenseful, uh, very very unnerving movie at times. And uh, yeah, it's it's got an impact that it will have on you if you let it. And so yeah, for as an 11 year old boy, um, it certainly did that to me. And I guess. Uh, hang on, I'm trying to get back to the, like, why did I bring up my dad? I guess I'm just saying thanks, dad, if he listens. Uh, if he listens to this, thanks for exposing me to uh, horror movies from a younger age, because I'm, I'm glad it, it, was, it was healthy for me, even though it scared the crap out of me. <laughs> um, in particular, I, I don't remember what's, like, what city I was at, like where I was at when I, when I saw the movie. I know I definitely saw it in the movie theater for sure. And, excuse me, I remember in particular because it was a night show, and when I got out of the movie theater, we, yeah, we were driving back to my dad's house, and I know for a fact that we were passing by cornfields, because I live in Iowa, so there's a lot of corn here, and corn is a, uh, I would say, a central part of this movie, and, yeah, uh, yeah. that, like, you know, I'm trying to think what a good example of this would be, but, like, there's certain horror movies that can take something that ordinarily might not seem scary to you and make it scary. Well, Signs does that with corn <laughs> because when this movie was over, I was really weirded out by corn for a while. Like, I, I didn't like looking at it. I didn't want to be by it. Certainly not alone. I, I'd get all paranoid if I did happen to go by it for some reason and like be like, is there an alien in there? Is there you know some kind of creature in there that wants to harm me? What is going on with this? I don't know. But that's that's part of the beauty of, of this movie, just strictly from a horror perspective, is some of the psychological games it plays it plays on you just by its use of sound design alone and and just uh, it's kind of less is more approach, which I'll I'll explore a little bit later on in this episode. But it's made me re- made me really afraid of corn. Um, I guess I still ate it from time to time, though not really as an a. Uh, I take that back. As an eleven year old boy, I I didn't really like vegetables all that much. Um, I eat salads and whatnot now, so I guess that's my my justification. But I don't really eat that many vegetables now. Um, corn sometimes, maybe if it's on the cob. Why, why am I okay? This is too much thoughts on corn, but you know, <laughs> uh, what are you gonna do? Um, <clears throat> I would also say that signs, apart from its fear of corn that it might give you, or just overall suspicion and heebie-jeebies and whatnot, 
I actually think that, again, this is a movie that I would, I would argue it's a mind expanding movie because it really makes you think about how you look at things, or at least that's how that's one of my many takeaways from this movie is it, it really kind of changed. Uh, I remember just from like an impactful level, it was just one of those movies that really stuck with me for a while apart from the horror because a lot of the elements and, and, and themes going on throughout the movie that it's exploring deal with how you look at things, your perception on things. And I think this movie was effect. It was affecting to me on that because I'm not saying like, this is like, you know, I've heard, I've heard other people like talk about how the movie signs is like one of those movies that like made them examine movies a little bit more. I don't think it did that for me, at least not for movies, not yet, but for the world at large, I definitely remember signs just made me have a period of time where I was just trying to look at things from outside of my own world that I live in my own bubble. Uh, Sorry about that. Hopefully you didn't hear that. uh, A little pop-up came up there. Go away, pop up. Um, but anyway, it's a very very interesting movie. So let's just let's just jump into to all of that. Um, so one of the, one of the things that I very much appreciate about this movie is the music, the score by James Newton Howard, who I I, I want to say that that Shyamalan uh, worked with him probably on The Sixth Sense, maybe a couple other of his other pictures. Uh, oh, actually, I'm I'm almost certain which. I'm sitting in front of a computer, so I I gotta I gotta double check it. But I think that James Newton Howard did the score for <clears throat> for Unbreakable. Let me. Yep. Okay. Yep. He did. So all right. I'm I'm glad my knowledge is not failing me just yet. So <clears throat> the reason I bring up the the score for this is because well, one, it's just so it's so damn good. It's so good, and you you get that feel right from the opening credits shot, uh, which the opening credits, I mean, those alone are, they're, I mean, it's phenomenal. In, in this movie, it, it starts perfectly with, uh, I'm not going to say the expression, right, but if you've seen the movie, you'll know what I'm talking about. It starts with this, um, oh my gosh, I'm going to go insane if I can't think of the actual word for it. You know, when there's a circle of light, but there's darkness around it. Someone's going to say I'm a moron out there that doesn't know how to, that doesn't know how to say it. But <clears throat> it essentially begins with this slow, soft light getting built up in the center. And the music just kind of eerily, creepily goes in the... That's really, like, it's terrible. But just the way... It, it eases you into the mood of the movie, the atmosphere of the movie, just through simple music and simple visuals. Again, like the opening credits, they're nothing like spectacular from a visual standpoint, but it's simple and it's effective. Um, <clears throat> whoever the animators or, or graphic artists that, that worked on that, um, I'm giving you praise because I don't know if anyone else really has before or appreciates it, but from the get-go... They animate it so perfectly to sync with the music because the music has like this soft, steady, suspenseful build, and then it's just like bam! It just it just gets right into it. It explodes. It's just like na 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 na. I <laughs> just just look up the opening credits for Signs, and you'll understand why I'm doing that. But it's incredible, and I think what I really like about it is, aside from well, aside from everything I mentioned, I love how. The main theme of the movie, which is used in the opening credits, it really, it's so fitting because this movie can go from very quiet moments to intense psychological terror moments. And the music ramps, it it, it explores that up and down. It has a, a rhythm to it that it's fitting to encapsulate both of those different vibes that this movie is exploring. And... It's it's absolutely great, and I, I love it. I mean, to this day, I think it's one of my favorite opening credit sequences I've seen for a movie. Um, <clears throat> and interesting, interesting as well as I, I was as I was thinking about the opening credits for Signs, I was thinking, 
does every movie actually need opening credits? I don't know if anyone else has ever thought of that, you know. I, I think an obvious example, I mean, if it is obvious, it is to me. You know, James Bond movies, for one, they have a very distinct opening credit sequence. It's very creative, very elaborate, very artistic, um, and it goes through everything. There's not really typically, you know, location shots during the opening credits. It's usually like almost its own creative, crazy world. And I'm just always interested by the movies that decide to do just pure opening credits without showing any actors, without showing any locations, without showing any of the sets or anything. It's just pure title cards and and moving in and out of the animations or however you want to look at it. But it got me thinking, like, what other, what are some other opening credit sequences that I can remember that I enjoyed seeing for the movie for whatever different reason? Um, one, this, this is not, I wouldn't say an opening credits per se, but of course, Star Wars, for one, um, made the title crawl be a popular thing, at least for those movies. I can't say I've seen another movie do quite, uh, the same thing that those movies did where they had the story drop down, um, from the top of the, the screen, but... No, I don't know. I don't know why I'm exploring the opening credits right now, but it's it's interesting. And I'm sure I'd actually be very curious if anybody wants to, um, you know, drop me a message on Instagram or comment on there. Uh, let me know what some of your favorite opening credit sequences are and why. Uh, I'd be really curious to to unpack that a little bit and see if there's, uh, you know, maybe, maybe a bit more to it, you know. And, and also, when's it fitting? Because sometimes... Sometimes there's certain movies that they just jump straight into it, you know? I mean, like, they they will either just, like, you know, they throw the title on and just go, or there's some that don't even have any opening credits. You're just right in the movie right from the get-go, and then they save all the credits and, and whatnot for the end of the film. So, creatively speaking, it's very, it's very interesting. And I try to think, would it have made a difference if signs didn't open the way it does? Like if it just maybe had like a soft fade on the farmhouse or it stopped, it, it started with just a shot of corn kind of waving around with like clouds and no sound or something. Like I could go crazy thinking about all the, all the possibilities for how it could have, how it could have affected the movie if it hadn't have done it. But I don't know. I'll, I'll I'll leave that to your imagination to think about, but it, it fascinates me. Um, <clears throat> the other the other piece I think I I may have mentioned it earlier when I talked about the music is that I love it when a composer is confident enough in themselves when they can take the main theme if they make a main theme for a movie and then essentially the rest of the score of the sound of the sorry score soundtrack they get kind of mixed up in my head sometimes but when the composer is able to take the main theme of a movie and then essentially unpack that main theme and dissect it and and intricately intricately weave it in in smart ways across the movie i i I find it brilliant um and james new and howard i i i would love to to learn how composers are able to do that, how they're able to take one song and turn it into 10 and still have it echo the, the main components of the main theme. I just musically speaking, I am incredibly fascinated with that process and I don't always know if it gets recognized, uh, from the general, uh, movie going audience. I'm, I'm not really sure. It's something I appreciate when I, when I hear it in, in films, but I don't know if, if others are seeing it. So maybe, maybe I'm alone. Maybe I'm not. Maybe a lot of people can pick up on that, but it's worth mentioning for the movie signs. And moving on from the music and signs, I think, uh, another great, great aspect of this movie that it's again, endlessly fascinating is, its use of perspective starting from <clears throat> starting from just the the location of the movie because it's all it all takes place in uh, I believe it's Bucks County Pennsylvania um, where that is on the map I couldn't really tell you but it takes place in a small community in Pennsylvania and it's all from the it's all told from the perspective of this family being a father uh, that was a priest that's that's Mel Gibson 
um, his younger brother, Merrill, uh, Joaquin Phoenix, and then uh, Mel Gibson's children, or sorry, Graham Hess's children, however we want to call, refer to him throughout this episode. Um, so it's all from the perspective of the small family on this farm. And what I like, and I know it's, it's obviously intentional and it's done for the sake of the story, but <clears throat> even that forced perspective throughout the movie of some crazy alien invasion happening, you know, aliens are coming, there's world terror, there's all these things that are likely happening around them, but but the movie's never showing that. And I, th- I think that's... Well, it's very smart for the sake of this movie. It's very Hitchcocky in that way. Alfred Alfred Hitchcock, um, to be exact. And I don't know how many of my audience members actually have seen an Alfred Hitchcock movie. I mean, the guy he's he's been passed away for a long time. Uh, Vertigo and Psycho, um, some of these different movies. They're they're quite old at this point. So I'm not gonna blame you if you haven't seen some of those, but. Um, Shyamalan seems to take uh, take influence after Hitchcock like a lot of horror, uh, horror filmmakers do. But the point is is that the the perspective on that is it's very interesting for the story in particular because I feel like when you see movies that involve aliens and the world ending and things like that, it's common for them to like show these different city shots of like this is what's happening in Paris. this is Japan. it's it's a world disaster and this takes the concept of an alien invasion and just puts it again just purely in the perspective of a family a family is not going to be in any of those different cities they're not going to know what's going on they're going to be worried about themselves about understanding the situation from a, you know just from a, a common man perspective i i don't know if that makes sense but i found it refreshing um, because you don't really see much, you know, a lot of this movie you could argue is minimal. It is going for less is more, um, which I, I, I will, I, yeah, I'll I'll talk about that a little bit later, but it's very minimal and it's got a very, uh, unique perspective on how it is making you take a look at the world. And when I think of that concept as well, is just when you think about how you view things, do you ever stop and think that you're looking at things simply from the perspective of your own world? Do you know what that means? Like when I say that, do you like do you do you kind of get what I'm saying with that? Because it's not like me, you know, me Jordan. It's not like I'm not a part of this world. I'm a part of the same world that everybody shares. We're all a part of of Earth. You know, we all live on the same planet here, but our perspectives are shaped by our environment they are shaped by our upbringing our experience our financial uh, well-being there's so many different things that shape what we perceive to be our world and <clears throat> it's kind of like when um, to borrow a, a concept or a line from the movie Goodwill Hunting you know Robin Williams at one point he talks about how um, it's interesting that, you know, when you form a relationship, uh, romantic or platonic or who, however you want to look at it, when you form a relationship, you're inviting someone into your own weird little world, as he describes in that movie. Uh, but I bring that up for the for signs because, <clears throat> because of this all being told from a family's perspective, you're seeing things purely from how someone living in exactly their part of the world um, exactly with their circumstances for all the different things I mentioned would see something like an alien invasion. And so it just, it just gets me thinking like, what are things that I look at in my own world that, you know, are solely unique just to my perspective, that things that only I would probably be able to, to see that, that other people are not seeing, you know, because I, I can't pretend to see what somebody else is, is experiencing in, in, in their life. You know, their life is their life. It's not my life. I, I, I don't have any control over, over what they do or, or how I could look at it. So I don't even know if, if any of that makes sense when I say it out loud. It's just, I, I find it very fascinating that one person that is in the same world with us, you know, somebody that's on the same planet with us could go through the exact same 
experience from a, a logic standpoint or a fact standpoint, meaning that the same exact events could transpire around them, but they see it and interpret it completely differently. It is not at all the same how I'm going to experience it or the person even next to me that's experiencing it right here in the same room with me. It doesn't work like that. It's just, I don't know. I think maybe it's just part of being human. It's uh, one of the best parts of being human is that, thank God, uh, we do not see things the same from one person to another. It makes life more interesting. I, you know, that, that's how I see it anyway. But the movie's fantastic on how it explores that, and I think it does it very, very uh, intelligently. So, um, talking about the, the, you know, just more of the movie itself, I, I did want to talk about the cast. Um, <clears throat> M. Night Shyamalan, uh, writer, director, producer, um, you know, the guy's caught some flack in, in recent years, you know, last decade. Um, I, you know, I don't have to go over and regurgitate some of the, the shit that people were giving him between last airbender, you know, th- the village being a divisive movie lady in the water was pretty much unanimously hated. Um, you know, and then eventually he kind of started coming back. He did the visit, which I, I actually enjoyed that. And <clears throat> I think Split was the movie that brought him back. But I don't care. I don't want to talk about the guy's divisive career. I want to talk about how I think overall he is a gifted filmmaker. And he is talented. And he has a voice and a distinct perspective. Um, his movies to some people are like a genre in and of themselves. I mean, how many, how many times have I heard people joke about, Oh, what's going to be the twist? Like what's going to be the twist at the end of his movie? Cause he always has a way of, of twisting things in, in ways that you don't expect. But I don't know as, as a filmmaker, I'm not saying me as a filmmaker, but I'm saying if I were a filmmaker, I would think it's actually pretty high praise that over my career that I've been able to, to have such a, a distinct viewpoint be, um, be given opinion, I guess, by, by people, people have that strong enough opinion about my films, you know, for better or worse. I mean, that means they're remembering you. Um, it sounds a little bit egotistical when I say it like that, you know, at least they remembered you, at least they remembered me. I, I don't know. Do it. Do I need to be remembered? Uh, I don't know. Maybe, 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 maybe not. Uh, I'll, I'll <laughs> once again, I put it on you. You tell me. You know, you tell me. Um, but I think this is great. I, th- I think Signs is one of M Night Shyamalan's best movies. I, I put it right up there with Unbreakable, Sixth Sense. I do like Split. Um, there's other movies that Shyamalan's done. I, I haven't actually seen his most recent one yet. Old. Uh, I heard some mixed things about it. Maybe somebody could tell me out there what they thought about that movie, but I, I would, I would like to see it. Uh, but anyways, it, it's, it's a great movie. And I think this is, this would arguably be, I would say one of his best written movies, which once I explore some of the actual themes of the story here, I think you'll begin hopefully to see, uh, why I would make such a claim like that. Uh, of course it has Mel Gibson, um, I could talk about Mel Gibson and I likely will in other episodes of the podcast, but Mel Gibson's been one of my all time favorite actor, um, creators, you know, uh, artists for my whole life. Lethal weapon was one of my very first favorite movies I had. I wanted to grow a mullet when, <laughs> when I was in high school. Um, I should have done it though. Damn it. You know, I, I honestly think like, I, I mean, sure. I probably would have been made fun of or, you know, whatever, but at the same time, I find the older in life you get, you're you're going to get along in this life a lot better the less you care about what other people think of your style or your choices and things along those lines. Like, if you want to gain any semblance of confidence, I think you have to kind of put that stuff to the side and, and just own who you are. You know, if you want to have a mullet, then then damn it. Grow a, grow a mullet. Do it. I don't, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, you, you, you can do it if you want to. Um, I don't think I could get away with doing that right now um my fiance would probably murder me but but maybe maybe i could do it i mean hey if it sucks i'll shave my head right does anyone want to see me have a mullet does anyone even know what i look like because i i don't have video support for this thing yet but (laughs) uh i think you get it but anyways mel gibson great actor 
Uh, this is one of my favorite movies with him, and I do think he delivers a, inc- an incredibly measured and emotional performance in this. I, I think Mel Gibson, if I think of any of his actor traits that stand out, he's one of the few actors I've seen in several movies that puts raw, you know, he puts himself in very vulnerable pra- uh, vulnerable places as an actor, and when he is having scenes where he's having to cry or be very distressed over something. I mean, he's one of the most believable I've seen at it um, in my experience. And in particular in this movie, the, the dinner sequence is, Oh, it's heartbreaking, but it's, it's, it's powerful. It's, I think it's one of the best scenes actually of the, of the whole movie. <clears throat> movie also has Joaquin Phoenix. Um, I mean, what can I say about Joaquin Phoenix that hasn't been said? The guy is now finally, thank goodness, uh, an Oscar winner from his Joker performance. But he's he's great. I'm not going to say that he. I'm not going to put him on like an award caliber performance. I'm not saying every movie an actor has to do needs to be garnering after that golden statue. But he's great in this, and I thought him and Mel they have really good chemistry together. Um, they have some good banter back and forth as well, because that's that's one thing I should comment on, uh, at least going back to M. Night. His movies always have a way of interweaving some comedy here and there between the suspense or horror moments, and, and this movie's no different. Um, in particular, one of the scenes that stands out is where the uh, police officer um, deputy, I can't remember the actress who plays her, but they're sitting at the table, and you know they had the, the alien that was crawling around on their on their rooftop earlier. And she's asking them details about, like, who this intruder was because they don't know it's an alien. And <laughs> they just keep saying to each other, they're just like, well, um, it, it, it was very dark. <laughs> and and then <clears throat> she tries to throw out this theory that it could be, like, a Scandinavian female Olympian. And, and Joaquin Phoenix is like, okay, well, excluding the possibility that a Scandinavian female Olympian was on the roof of our house last night what else might be a possibility? <laughs> it's just, it's just little, little things like that, but it, it helps break up the tension perfectly. And, and Joaquin delivers those moments. Well, uh, they're comedic, but they're also convincing. And I do ultimately think that his character, Merrill, uh, especially towards the third act, towards the climax of the movie, he, his character in a way is kind of, uh, one of the central hearts of the movie. And, and one of the signs, uh, so to speak, that you know maybe perhaps was meant to be there. We'll we'll get into that in a second. Um, so his kids, Mel Gibson has children. Um, Graham's Graham Graham. Um, real really really quick side note here. I've always liked the name Graham. I just want to admit that out loud. I don't think I've ever told anybody that. I always really liked that name, and I don't know why. Maybe just because I don't hear it that much, or it's got it's old fashioned. It seems uh, I don't know. It's got a nice ring to it. Who knows? Maybe if I have a son, he will be named Graham. Um, Mizola, if you're listening, I'm sure you probably won't agree with that. But, uh, yeah, I don't know. Does anybody else like that? Eh, Whatever. Let's go back to the kids. So, the kids, uh, Rory Culkin, which is, uh, I mean, most, not that it matters. I'm sure he probably gets annoyed by this, but he is related to Macaulay Culkin, a.k.a. the kid from Home Alone. Uh, but I don't, I don't like to always, I don't like to always do that. I mean, cause think about it. That's gotta be annoying from, from their perspective. It's like, Oh, you're always being compared to your brother. You know, you're really famous brother. Like that's gotta suck. So sorry. I just did it, I guess on this podcast, but I'm just trying to give some context. So, um, Rory, if you're listening, which eh, who knows, maybe, maybe you are, um, not, you know, nothing but love for your performance as a child in this movie. That's, <laughs> that's what I gotta say. Um, but he's really good in this. Uh, both both him and Abigail Breslin are. Um, Abigail Breslin in particular, she's a very. Uh, I don't know, how do I? I don't, I'm really weird about distri- uh, describing kids, especially in movies. Like I don't I don't know why. It's like they're 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 actors. They're not any different than the adults, other than their age. But for some reason, it's like I don't know how to describe kids. Eh, I have to work on that, I guess. But they're both good in this movie. Um, very very good. <clears throat> Now, interesting thing that I want to talk about when it comes to 
perspective, and perhaps I will lean into this a little bit more when I actually talk about the signs, um, you know, that, that whole element in this movie. But I, I couldn't help but note to myself that because of the minimalistic approach to this movie, the use of perspective, I, I really like how it explores the idea of do you necessarily have to see things to believe it? And, and let me explain what I mean by that. So <clears throat> this movie is very minimal from a lot of different viewpoints, but one of them is that it uses the less is more approach. Uh, and in particular for the aliens, because, and, and I, I, I'm, I guess I might be spoiling some of this movie. I mean, this has been out since 2002. So I, I'm going to assume a lot of you have seen it and you're just wanting to, you know, listen to this episode. Cause maybe you just want to hear, hear someone talk about signs. So I don't know, but I'm going to, I'll try to, I'll try not to spoil too much. So I, I, I will really, really, really try my best, but <clears throat> You don't hardly see the aliens and it's brilliant from, I mean, one from a lot of different perspectives. I mean, financially, you don't have to blow a bunch of money on special effects because you can, you can play around with things. There's a lot of things that you can uh, explore and, 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 and trick, not, not trick, but manipulate people or make them subscribe to different ways of thinking when you're watching it, because this is a very psychological film. And, because of it not really showing the aliens that much, a lot of the, you know, the family, the central characters in the movie, they are having to experience either hearing about the aliens on the television, um, maybe from the local cop, because that's like the one other person that they like talk to in this movie that mentions, uh, actually, she doesn't mention aliens. She talks about the crop circles. But the point is, is that they're not really seeing the aliens directly. Um save for the very end. And I I think it's it's interesting <clears throat> the main the main part I'm trying to get at that I think it's interesting is when it's exploring faith, which um, maybe maybe I'll yeah, 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 I'll I'll, I'll get into it now, why not? So <clears throat> No, no, no. I changed my mind. I, I don't want to throw off my rhythm. So just, <laughs> hey, I got to I gotta talk this out sometimes. This is this is how you progress. This is how you make sense of things. You just got to, you got to, you got to do it sometimes. But anywho, seeing as, seeing as believing is an interesting concept that I think this movie works with. And it makes me kind of wonder for myself and other things like am I always somebody that would have to see something directly with my own eyes to believe it and I think that's what I was trying to get at is like if they're watching something on the television like it's not like it's happening right next to them but yet it's television or it's coming from a place of authority they're they are taken aback by it they are completely um you know they're completely transfixed on this device that's telling them something and they're just eating it up and I'm not saying they're like that the whole time. I mean, I'm not saying they just blindly follow whatever the television says. But, you know, the world's a big place. And so you don't have the luxury to be able to see everything all the time. So sometimes you do have to believe something just by hearing about it. Or or what I would say this movie arguably explores is, you know, a deeper concept, which is your faith in something. You know, how how you're able to really you know, take in something yourself and, and have it become part of you. I, I don't, I don't know. I don't know on that one. That's, that's, well, it's, it's interesting. It's very, I mean, I'm going to say that a lot and be a broken record. I got to maybe work on that. Don't say, don't say interesting as much, but it is, it is. That's why I'm talking about it. That's why you're listening to it, right? <laughs> um, yeah, let's, let's, let's move on. Um, <clears throat> so aliens talked about the aliens cause we don't see much of them in this, but yet we're pretty freaked out by the notion of it. Cause psychologically you're going to work up in your mind what it could be. And because the movie doesn't hardly show you that much, you're freaking yourself out by listening, hearing the sounds, the signs, everything like that. But anywho, I want to talk about aliens. Not going to get too, too into the aliens, maybe for another movie that focuses on them more, but for the sake of this story, I 
think that they are plausible. Um, the the way that it set up, you know, with the crop circles, you know, they're not really showing them much, but they're explaining the methodology for like why aliens would navigate with crop circles. You can buy into some of it. Now, granted, <clears throat> some of the stuff with the aliens in this. Um, again, if you've seen the movie, this this right here, spoiler, you can shut it off after I said this if you want to, and then I'll say stop, spoiler, whatever. But save for the fact that they're affected by water, which there's a bunch of people out there that gave this movie a lot of shit, and they continue to this day, where they're just like, oh, like, why would the aliens come to a planet that's, like, covered 80% by water, and, you know, they get a splash on them, and they melt, like, that's stupid. <sighs> it very well may be, but... I don't think that's what the movie's uh, main thing is going for. And honestly, for the sake of plot, I mean, I don't care. It works for the sake of plot. I bought into it. You know, aliens, do they have to always be super hyper intelligent and be light years beyond us? I mean, yes, they mastered space flight and all these other things, but I don't know. Maybe they didn't know about water. Uh, I, I, I don't know. Maybe I'm just giving excuses for it. Maybe it is stupid. <laughs> I, I don't know. But <clears throat> for the sake of this movie, I, I mean, I, I, I bought into him, uh, especially as an 11-year-old boy seeing that. Yeah, I bought into him. Uh, the, the, the brief glimpses you get, they're scary. And they seemed, uh, they seem, yeah, they're pretty freaky. They can camouflage too, which that was a unique aspect of this movie. They could change their skin color kind of like a chameleon. Which I can't say every alien's able to do that. Of course, everyone uh, interprets aliens differently in in movies that depict them, but whatever. Um, so talking about uh, the aliens and, and why they get to Earth. Well, they, they use the crop circles, I guess, to navigate Earth. And crop circles was something I wanted to touch on because... <clears throat> excuse me. Um... Be honest, I didn't really have time to do a great deal of extensive research about crop circles uh, prior to this episode. I'll, you know, I'm kind of an impulsive person sometimes, and so I'm gonna look up crop crop circles right now, and we're gonna we're gonna unpack some of this together. Why not? So the official definition, at least according to Wikipedia, if you want to call that a reliable source. It states that a crop circle is a crop formation or a corn circle. Uh, it's in a pattern created by flattening a crop, usually a cereal. And the term was first coined in the early 1980s by someone named Colin Andrews. I'm, I'm, you know, I honestly wouldn't be surprised. There's somebody out there that's listening that's just like, oh, Colin Andrews. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Big, big crop circles guy. I know everything there is to know about crop circles. And hey, if you do. Um, yeah, send me a message or something. Let's talk crop circles. That sounds really interesting. But <clears throat> let's let's click this. I'm going to click this first link that popped up uh, on the old Google feed. So it, it's talking about how crop circles are these strange patterns that mysteriously appear overnight in farmers' fields. They provoke a lot of puzzlement, delight, and intrigue amongst press, public alike. And the circles are mostly found, according to this article, in the United Kingdom, but have spread to, they, they spread to a lot of different countries uh, in the world over the past decades, and they've inspired different books, blogs, fan, fan groups, uh, researchers, I guess there's a, a, an expression for this, they call them seriologists, I don't know if I've explained that, oh, and Hollywood movies, uh, like this movie Signs. Um, <clears throat> But there's a lot of whole whole different theories about like the early crop cir- uh, early crop circles, modern ones, uh, the theories and expla- uh, explanations around them. Who made them? Is it aliens? Is it people? Is it just a bunch of hippies? Um, I don't really know. But what I will say is it's an endlessly fascinating topic to think about, and I would actually be really, really quite interested to see how they how they get made now. Do I think aliens made them? It's it's worth asking. The movie asks that. It's only fair if I explore it myself. And maybe. I don't know. I, I mean, first off, I think aliens are real. I do. Um, 100% think they're real. And do they take the form and shape that Hollywood depicts them sometimes? Uh, maybe. Maybe not. Uh, there's evidence, I think, to support either conclusion. But... <clears throat> The crop circles thing is interesting because I guess I would assume that aliens would have advanced enough technology that through 
uh, whatever sophisticated means of radar that they have that they would be able to fly to our planet whether they land or come in i'm not really sure if they're like hovering outside of the ozone but i don't know i feel like they would still be able to like detect our major cities or figure out our planet navigationally speaking without having to elaborately cook up um Cir- beautiful i mean beautiful some of them are beautiful beautiful circle designs or elaborate patterns in 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 cornfields to to do it but maybe um maybe if they didn't possess it or if they were you know doing as this movie refers to at one point probing uh perhaps they would find some utility in, in making the crop circles or maybe maybe it's like some weird psychological thing they're playing on the species you know it makes us all go crazy with hysteria while we're all focused on the crop circles it's a distraction and they're you know over here doing something else i i don't know um i would actually i'd actually really like to shit i want to talk more about crop circles Is anybody out there a crop circles expert if so message me you can you can email hey i'll throw out the podcast email if you know anything about crop circles email the podcast at screenspeakpodcast at gmail.com there you go you got my email for the podcast uh drop me a message on there because would love to talk to you it's a very interesting subject actually anywho (laughs) i didn't realize i was going to plug the crop circles so much um but i want to talk about the signs uh, at least some of the signs that are in this movie uh, or the concept of signs, which is, we'll probably talk more about the concept here. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll throw in one of the actual signs, the most literal one. Actually, yeah, I'll, I'll start with that and then, and then I'll keep going. Um, so one of the most literal signs that is in this movie is the glasses of undrank. Uh, undrank, is that, is that even a word? They're, they're glasses of water. Oh my God. Glasses that have water in them that have not been drank. And they are just sitting on a bunch of various different countertops and areas of the farmhouse. Am I saying that correctly? Maybe. I don't know. You get what I'm saying. There's a bunch of glasses of water. They're all lying around the house and they show it throughout the movie often different times and you kind of think it's maybe for comedic relief or you know because it's just part of like this quirky kid and and her little tick that she doesn't drink water and so it's just part of making an interesting character it could be a lot of things but then it turns out that towards the end when one of these aliens that is around their farm is actually broken into their house the glasses of water it turns out are useful um, because they're scattered throughout everywhere and they find out through means I won't spoil that water is not good, uh, for the aliens. So in fact, all these glasses of water being around the house were a benefit, but as this movie explores, was it meant to be there? Like, was it a happy coincidence? Was it, you know, was it a divine, um, divine action? You know, was God watching out for them? Part of that ties into religion, but that's kind of what I wanted to talk about because that to me is the most very interesting aspects of this movie. And some of the things that I think make this one of my favorite movies, just not even horror movies, but movies because within the scares and the suspense, it's really exploring an interesting, an interesting psychological um, aspect or philosophical, or maybe even, I don't know, whatever, whatever the words are for it being tied to your faith, um, fact versus faith. I don't know how, if I'm saying that right, but one of the scenes that really encapsulates this well, and if, if it's allowed on here, I'm going to really, I'm going to, I'm going to try to do it and and see if I can get away with it, but I'm going to throw in, I'm going to throw in the audio clip of the two groups scene of people breaking down the two groups. I'm going to throw in a bit of it. I might not get away with doing the whole segment, but here it is. I want to throw in this sequence right now. People break down into two groups. When they experience something lucky, group number one sees it as more than luck, more than coincidence. They see it as a sign, evidence that there is someone up there watching out for them. Group number two sees it as just pure luck. Happy turn of chance. 
I'm sure the people in group number two are looking at those 14 lights in a very suspicious way. For them, the situation is a 50-50. Could be bad. Could be good. But deep down, they feel that whatever happens, they're on their own. And that fills them with fear. But there's a whole lot of people in the group number one. And they see those 14 lights. They're looking at a miracle. And deep down, they feel that whatever's going to happen, there will be someone there to help them. And that fills them with hope. See, what you have to ask yourself is what kind of person are you? Are you the kind that sees signs? sees miracles or do you believe that people just get lucky or look at the question this way is it possible that there are no coincidences so that 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 scene is that that scene is powerful it's it's I mean, one, it's actually beautifully well shot. I always actually like how when the camera's focused on Mel, it's cutting off half of his face, showing, in my opinion, that there is a confliction within the person, the light and the darkness. And, you know, Graham, his character himself, is having a spiritual crisis uh, with his wife dying not that long ago from tragic means and means that were out of his control. And for somebody that is a pastor, is a priest. I don't know. There's a lot that could be said about how that death took his faith and, and shook it and rattled it. But I love how I love that whole sequence, that whole monologue about people being in two different groups, because I don't think he's, he's not ultimately wrong. I don't always like to simplify things that much because life for lack of a better word is complicated and I think there is some, there's an argument to be made for people being in either one of the groups. I wonder myself sometimes which group I would see myself in. I would say if I had to lean towards it, uh, probably similar to Joaquin's character, I, I guess, I, I you know, I'm, I'm somebody that, I think sees sees signs, sees uh, miracles, um, unexplained phenomenons that I don't think are always just pure coincidence, pure chance. Though I do think that there is such a thing as luck. I think luck exists and people getting lucky and, you know, coincidence happening. But I also think there's a force at work in the world that can't be explained and this force is capable of a lot of different things that are, we can see with the eye and there's other things I don't think that we can. And I don't know. It makes me think like, you know, am I actively, am I actively looking for signs? Cause that's, that's one of the things I think this movie does is that it's very smart. If you go back and revisit this movie and pay attention to some of the specific shot choices, you will see there are, a lot of signs within the movie that are subtle, but intentional and purposeful as well. I would say, I mean, that's the same thing as intentional, I guess, but makes you see things differently and makes you question if there is something behind things, you know, if there's God or if there is a, a, a power in the universe that's controlling things. Uh, I don't want to get too much into the faith side of it, though this movie is exploring that quite a bit and, and asking the audience, I think, the question of faith or fact sometimes. Um, but I find it very interesting. I guess I'm just posing the question out there of just, do you, you know, when you're going around in the world, do you see things that happen around you as just being life happening? Do you think there is a rhyme or reason to things? Are things meaningless? Is there no reason to anything? Or is there something more? And is there a beyond past this life? And, you know, is there heaven? Is there hell? Is there all these, you know, pretty, pretty, you know, wide reaching uh, concepts? But yeah, 
I really appreciate a movie that can intelligently ask me that question and have me ponder it while still scaring the bejesus out of me and making me afraid of corn. <laughs> um, but I do want to. I want to go. I want to go back to the faith just a little bit more on here. I want to. I want to talk about that just a bit more because <sighs> faith. It's it's one of the beautiful through lines I think of this movie is is how it deals with faith and and approaches it uh, specifically in Mel's character and in, in Graham because and again I I don't I won't spoil too much on this but he is troubled in his faith I'll just put it that way to say the least uh at the start of the movie I think it's all but dead um he's very he's in a very dark place understandably so because of what's happened with his his wife and the burden I don't want to say that negatively, but you know, it's a burden when you're a single parent and you have to raise children on your own. Um, but there's a lot that can be said about, about faith and, and his faith in particular, and it's tests that he's having throughout this movie. And I do think his faith is being tested. And also just as faith goes, broadly speaking, I, I can tell you in my own life, uh, yeah, your faith will test you all the time. I, again, I, I know sometimes it can make people uncomfortable when you get preachy because you can get holier than now and, you know, it makes makes people on edge. You're trying to be like, oh, gosh, he's trying to convert me or something like that. At least that's been my that's been my experience with religion. I can get kind of uncomfortable about it even still to this day. I mean, I... I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll say it right now. I mean, I'm a Christian right now. I was raised that way and... Um, Christian Catholic, I, I guess my, my fiance, she's Catholic and, uh, um, likely when I get married, I, I suspect I will be converting over though. I don't know all the full particulars of that yet, to be honest. But, um, point is though, is that I think I, I do have, I am a person of, of faith, uh, to an extent at least. Um, it's always, Faith is an interesting subject to talk about just with religious people or not religious people because it extends to certain levels within people and, and everybody has a different interpretation of it, I find. But I am a person of faith, I would say, and um, <clears throat> I can certainly connect with on that kind of spiritual level Graham's character going through this constant battle of wanting God to watch out for him but at the same time hating him for choices or you know things that happen around him and trying to under put you know put some understanding to it and oftentimes i think when people can't put something concrete on something they can't slap a label on something you know that's that's where faith can play something it can play into that because you know faith doesn't have labels on everything so it's easy to have it fill in a gap when you can't identify it as being anything else not sure if that makes sense but <clears throat> It is sad to see his character losing his faith, being lost in his faith. I I think that anybody that is having to to go through something like that, whether it is over a death or I don't even think you have to have anything really tragic to to be questioning it like that to to have it be tested, to have it be diminished or having darkness uh within yourself be taking the center stage i i don't know you know it, th this is a complicated subject and i i wish i could unpack it more in this episode but <sighs> yeah i i don't i don't know aaron aaron the thoughts out on this though for sure on the podcast but it's the the M. Night Shyamalan explores it tactfully and he explores it well and it's it's obviously fantastic for the movie and especially especially the end too. I mean, I really like the end of this movie and and it's mildly uplifting message I would say about faith or what what the power of it can have. I some people may not agree with that interpretation and and you know, more power to you. You have every right, but I I think it's uh it's a testament to the this movie signs is a testament to the roller coaster journey that faith can have within your life and 
in this context with a uh, pending alien invasion happening and potentially your your children being at risk and the the world around you being in peril and you trying to make sense of it all i think it's it would be very hard to be in a situation like that and not ask yourself the question of is is god looking out for me or is there a god or you know some of those really heavy-handed questions but um yeah m night m night my man i gotta give it up to you 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 wrote a hell of a movie it may have come out in 2002 which i still cannot believe that saying that out loud holy crap but yeah it's um i think that's what i wanted to say about that so um but going forward i i'm i'm curious how how you and i guess i touched on this before but like you know how you look at things in the world and if you see a movie like Signs, or you could see Signs, or a movie like it, does does it change how you how you see things? Because that's one of, that's one of my absolute absolute favorite parts of a great movie, especially one like Signs, is it can just completely alter my perspective, and in the most positive way possible. Um, I love it. I mean, I love it when an artist has such a distinct voice and they work with a group of people that get the message and they want to get it out there and they want people to have an experience and, and go through something and, and talk about it and expand their minds and grow. Um, movies are just absolutely phenomenal for, for that aspect. And, and I really sincerely hope that enough people or more people can, can appreciate that about a really great film because that's that's one of the reasons why a movie like this and and other great great movies stay with people and people talk about them at great length for years and years is because they they affect you they they expand you they they they, they impact you they are just ugh i I don't, I don't know. Does, does that, does that make sense? I mean, I, I guess just simply put, it's like, I could just talk and talk and talk about this, but my God, do I love movies and I, I, I love them as an art form and I love what they can do. And I love that I'm able to even talk about a movie for this long and have people listen to it and hopefully hopefully feel engaged. I mean, I really hope this has been an engaging episode for you all and that you've enjoyed listening to this. Cause I, I, I was really pumped up to talk about this cause there's some truly, truly fascinating concepts to talk about within the movie signs. And I just, I find it endlessly entertaining. This is a, this is a suspenseful movie. Uh, it's a rewatchable movie. I think it is, it merits examination and dissection. It's just one of those movies where you can do that. And I would just absolutely love to to talk about this movie with with some of you someday, or just you know off the podcast, whatever. Um, I really, really hope that that this is a movie that you have seen and that you you know you enjoy. Or maybe if you don't enjoy, I mean, tell me why. I don't know. I, I that's that's one of the things I like about movies. They're so subjective. It's it's open to interpretation, like this movie's saying. Your your world's view is is open to how you see it, and I want to know how you see it. So. That's it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think that, I think that's all I got on on this episode. But I, I really sincerely appreciate each and every one of you for coming by, giving it a listen. Happy October! Uh, we got Halloween coming up. I'm 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 super pumped up for it. Uh, which I I didn't even expect I'd be saying I'm super pumped up for it out loud. But I love October. You know, you know, at least in the Midwest anyway, you can keep the windows open. The temperature starts cooling off. I can wear long sleeves again and not have to wear just boring t-shirt after boring t-shirt. And I get to, I get an excuse apparently to watch horror movies, which maybe, okay, this will be the last thing I'll say is I find it interesting that horror movies are always attributed with October, but it's like, why is it just because in a lot of places in the world, leaves are falling? It's like, it's cloudier or something. Maybe it looks more gloomy. Like, why is it that October got associated with horror movies? I'm sure there's a very plausible reason, and there's probably a lot of very obvious reasons, but I don't know. Maybe it's not a big deal. Maybe just someone decided that one day, and I'm the, I'm the you know nitwit that's sitting on a podcast trying to figure it out. <laughs> uh, I don't know. But, anywho, um, 
that's for you to think about thanks for coming by uh thanks for coming by screen speak uh really appreciate it go ahead do all the plugs that i said at the beginning of the episode follow share with share with your friends all that great stuff and uh just